Hallelujah, Jesus. Can you give the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, Jesus. Praise your name, Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm going to let you be seated. that aren't here today, look at what they're missing. <laughs> some can't help it. Some can. Some just too lazy to get up and come to church. <laughs> I'm glad I am in the house of the Lord to receive what God has for me. Amen. Thank you, guys. Hallelujah. Praise your name, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Woo, praise God. <laughs> That's right, sometimes it's worse, you know? <laughs> or better. <laughs> yes, sir. Hey, you know what? I want to tell you something. If you're looking for a starchy church, don't come here. Because that's not what we're about. We want to let God have His way. Amen. And because God was able to have his way today, <laughs> Andrew, I'm not going to embarrass you, brother, but because God was able to have his way, the Lord touched you this morning, did he not? Amen. And he has set you free, brother. And now he lives in your heart, and your heart is as pure and as white as snow. <laughs> Amen. Go ahead, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Amen. Sister, I know God touched you. <laughs> Amen. Great to have y'all today, by the way. Um, been following us on Facebook. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Keep putting those good posts on Facebook, praising the Lord and letting him know what's going on at RCF. Amen. Hallelujah. Thomas, come up here, brother, and read this scripture for us this morning. I've, I've got an important word to give to you this morning, I'm, and I, I, when I preach, I'm not, I'll try not to hold you very long, but I believe it's a word that God has for me. Come on, brother. Read the word that God has laid on your heart. I sure do like the Holy Ghost, don't you? Well, whoo-wee. He's my friend. I love him. Paul, you you preached a, a, a message this morning that uh, talking about uh, the fruit of the spirit, and that was the thing the Lord had laid on my heart this morning to read, and uh, it's really a menu. So anybody who knows how to bring things together and put things together, and make a menu or a menu, and and to uh, be able to make things and cook things, it starts off in Second uh, Peter. First of all, let me say. I give all praise and honor to my Lord who loves me and he loves you. That he would allow me to read his word. In Second Peter chapter 1, it reads, Greeting the fruitful or the faithful. Simon Peter, a bond servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now here's the menu. And these things, if you'll add these things together, whoo, you better be holding on. It says, fruitful growth in the faith. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, 
to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from the old sins. Therefore, brothers, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. That's important. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly in the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I like that part. It says, for so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Get your Bible and stand to your feet and hold it up real high, please. Amen. Get your Bible and hold it up. Look on the screen and say this with me this morning. This is our confession every time we meet together. Let's say it together. This is my Bible, God's holy word. I can do what it says I can do. I can have what it says I can have. I can speak with new tongues. I heal the sick. I cast out demons, all in the name of Jesus. The Bible is my legal document sealed by the blood of Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And if you would, turn in that Bible to the book of Acts, chapter number 1. And also, Psalm 107. Acts chapter 1 and Psalm 107. Don't forget, while you're turning, don't forget tonight's service at 6 o'clock. We normally have prayer on Sunday nights. But about once a month, we'll have a special service. And tonight, Thrive Youth Ministries is sponsoring the Youth Rally. We'd love for you to come out and join us And be a part of that service. Acts chapter 1 verses 1 and 2. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. Until the day in which he was taken up after he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. I know there's a comma there, but I'm going to stop right there. And I want you to turn over to the 107th Psalm. I want to read verses 20. 21. Psalm 107. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Lord, I thank you for your blessings and I thank you for the wonderful works <laughs> that you Perform for your children. Oh, hallelujah, Lord, we thank you for that. And I pray now, Father, that as we go into this message this morning, that the power of the Holy Spirit will once again be here to minister grace and peace, and most of all, the anointed word into our hearts. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said amen. Amen. The church is not a building. The church is not a social club. The church is not just a bless me station. But the church has a responsibility to proclaim the unadulterated, unwatered down word of God. We've got to preach what this word says. Regardless of what people have said or what they continue to say, we cannot be afraid to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now there's some truths in this word that we have been told that aren't true. You say, what? Oh, by the way, Brother Dennis, it is so great to have you on Sunday morning. We prayed. How many, how many of y'all know the prayer? We prayed that he'd get that new job at Walmart, and guess what? He got that new job at Walmart driving that truck at 6-3 day, and now he's going to be, get to be on some Sundays and Wednesdays. Hallelujah. We kept saying, it's yours, it's yours, it's yours. And the first time it came available for him, what happened, brother? He gets mine. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Don't tell me God's not concerned about everything. It's so great to have you, brother. Amen. Anyway, the church has a responsibility to preach the Word of God, to talk about what things are in here. But, you know, there's some things that we've been told through our, through our growing up days that, that really 
uh, with some some false ideas and have that has been ingrained in many Pentecostals throughout their entire church life. We've been told as Pentecostals, you can't, you know, God, you, you they believe. I, I'm trying to say this in a nice way. That's why I'm stumbling here. Okay, uh, we've been we've been told. Well, we, now we believe in healing, but God doesn't want to heal everybody. We've been told that you know we know that God owns a cattle on a thousand hills, but God doesn't want everybody to be wealthy. We've been told all kinds of things, and and we wanted to believe that we wanted to walk in that, and we did. And so we went around sick, and we went around poor and we went around in poverty and we went around in all this kind of stuff that God does not desire. Does that mean that God doesn't love us? No, God still loves us. God still cares for everything that we do. God wants to bless us. And you say, well, well, tell me then, where do I find the difference? How do I, how do I find out the truth? Well, first of all, in Acts chapter 1, Luke writes here, the former treatise have I written to you, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Jesus was not only a teacher, but he was a doer. Jesus was not only a teacher, but he was a doer. It's not enough just to be a teacher or a hearer. Now hearing, uh, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But we also know that James, the book of James, also talks about us being doers of the word of God. Putting that faith in action and doing what God has told us to do. What did Jesus do? Jesus healed people. He healed blind Bartimaeus. He healed the woman with the issue of blood. He raised the dead. He healed the sick. We could go on and on and on. There were miracles, turning water into wine, calming the storm, raising the dead. He taught. He was a teacher. He taught the Sermon on the Mount, taught in the synagogue, taught using parables, taught using uh, life situations and telling people uh, what, where they were at and how many husbands they had and how many of them had died. On and on and on it goes as Jesus was a doer a teacher and a healer and a worker, a miracle worker. We find that the apostles continued this ministry. We find that before the cross, Jesus anointed the disciples with the power to heal, the power to cast out devils, and the power to raise the dead. Because he told them in Matthew chapter 10, verses 7 and 8, And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you have received and freely give. You want me to take a breath now? This is what Jesus began both to do and teach. And then not only did he do this, then he, trans, he, he gave this power and authority to the apostles as well. Even while Jesus was still walking the earth, he shared in this ministry with his apostles. He gave them and anointed them to do the very same thing that he was doing. Can I say that again? He anointed them to do the very same thing that he was doing. Now God is no respecter of persons. God will anoint you to do the very same things that the apostles did. God will anoint you to do the very same things that Jesus did. Oh, wait a minute, don't put me on that level. Why not? Jesus said we could. He said, greater works than these shall you do, because I go unto my Father in heaven who sent me. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute, about, about these works that Jesus did, because you can really get confused about works. We find that even after the cross, after Jesus had, had died and had rose again, he said in Matthew 28, 18, 20, the, the great commission, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. So he gave them the commission. Even after the cross. Then he told them that they would be endued with power. In Luke chapter 24 verse 49. He said, And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. And we, you and I, know what that power was. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8 it says, That, they, that after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you shall receive power to become witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. They were to go into, into the city of Jerusalem, they were to go in the upper room, and they were to tarry there until the Holy Spirit fell upon them. They didn't know what it's going to look like, they didn't know what it's going to smell like, they didn't know what it's going to feel like, they had no idea what was going to happen. He just told them to go there and wait. And for ten days they sat in the upper room and they prayed and they waited. How many of y'all would have waited on God for ten days? Well, you know what? 
that 500 that had witnessed the resurrection of Jesus, 380 of them walked away because only 120 remained in the upper room. 380 couldn't wait. The other 380 left. Which crowd would you be in? Which one would you have fallen into? Would you have been with those 120 or would you have been with the 380 that said, Oh my gosh, what are we waiting on? We've wasted our time. We've been going down to that church and listening to Jesus teach in the synagogue for three years. And now he's dead and we've been hoodwinked. But 120 said, No, we haven't. No, we haven't. I know what I felt. I know what I experienced. I know whom I have believed. I tell you what this morning, I know who Jesus is. You know how I know who Jesus is? Because I met him here this morning. Because I felt him in our midst today. I've experienced his, his presence. I've experienced his, his love. I've experienced everything that he is deep within me. That's how I know who Jesus is. My Bible tells me that. And he shared that experience with me. Has he shared that experience with you? 380 must not have got what the other 120 got. They must not have felt what the other 120 felt. And there's a lot of people today that won't feel what you feel because they refuse to believe, they refuse to listen, and they refuse to submit to God. So he told them they'd be endued with power. That was 120. You know the story. They were endued with power. Mark chapter 16, verse 16 says, And these signs shall follow him that believes in my name. They shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. I believe we confessed that a while ago, didn't we? Whoa. We confess that. Amen. We confess it in the name of Jesus. If they shake up a serpent, it shall not harm them. If they drink any deadly poison, it shall not harm them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Those are the signs that are going to follow those that believe. Now, that's after Jesus has has gone on to heaven. He's at the right hand of the Father. Now, did he say those signs stopped? Did anywhere in there that it say that in the year uh, uh, 2013, this will no longer exist? I don't see an ending place to that. I see that those are signs that should follow believers like you and me today. Those are the same signs that should follow us as we go on. Just to prove the point, this was not only for the apostles, but all believers. We find in the book of Acts, seven men were chosen, full of the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 6. We find that Stephen, a layman, was full of the Holy Ghost and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. That's in Acts chapter 6, verse 3, also verses 5 through 10. Philip, the evangelist, had a great revival, did great miracles among the Samaritans in Acts chapter 8. These, these were people like you and I. Many in the early church were scattered, and it says they went everywhere preaching the word, and the hand of the Lord was with them, with them and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. And again, in Acts chapter 8, what, what chapter in the book of Acts you think you might want to read when you get home? All of them. How about chapter 8? Start right. The, the, and go. <laughs> the early church continued what Jesus began to do and teach. Would you say that with me? The early church continued to do what Jesus began to do and teach. Now what about in 2013? What are we supposed to be doing? All that Jesus began to do and teach. Now I don't find anywhere where Jesus ever said that God made people sick. Why does the church let that, let that go without being called on? Why, why do Christians allow people to say, in your presence, well, God must be getting some kind of glory out of this, out of my sickness and my illness. God put me in the hospital for a reason. Folks, if, it was, if God had his plan in perfect operation, there wouldn't even be any hospitals. If God's plan that he had for man was, was if people were following to its, to its T and doing what they believed, Amy, I'm sorry, but you wouldn't be in research because there would be no need for any. But because of man's failure to believe God, man's inability to walk in the Spirit, man's inability to control his flesh, we find that man is being bombarded with disease and sickness because of not what God is doing, but because of what man is doing. You see, you can find all kinds of raised eyebrows when you begin to preach this kind of stuff. 
Because people, and, and you know why people, you know why people criticize preachers who preach this kind of stuff? Because it's challenging their own faith. And, you know, they're holier than thou. And their theology is correct. Don't you dare. Don't you dare tell me that, 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 that I'm wrong. I've been living like this all my life. That's the problem. That's the problem. God wants you to change. He wants you to walk in freeness. He wants you to walk in freedom. He wants you to walk in health. I pray that the day comes when everybody who comes to Restoration Christian Fellowship, we won't have room to hold them because word will get out that none of us need a doctor. That none of us need a prescription. That none of us need a hospital. Is there something wrong with that? Is it okay to believe that? Will you believe it with me? But most importantly, is it scriptural? Wait a minute now. I have had three yeses. Is that scriptural? I believe it is. I believe it is. And, that, and that's where we're going to go back over here to Psalm 107, verses 20 and 21. I want you to look at this just a minute. The 107th Psalm is a thanksgiving to the Lord for his great works of deliverance. And you can read this. He, his mercy endures forever. The redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. I'm starting at the beginning. And gathered out of the lands from the east, from the west, from the north, from the south. They wandered in the wilderness in a desolate way. They found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Then they cried out to the Lord in the trouble, and he delivered them out of their distress. Now, I've got to ask you a question. If God wanted them to be in distress, why would he deliver them out of distress? If God wants you to be sick, then why are you praying for him to heal you? That doesn't make sense, does it? If God wants you to be poor, then why would you dare ask God to meet your financial needs? Doesn't make sense. It does not add up. It's the truth. Now, God didn't want them to be in distress. Why were they in distress? Not because God put them there, but because they got themselves there. That wasn't his plan, so he delivered them. What kind of person is it that would take one of these kids and knock a hole in their head on purpose so they could bring them to the church and ask God to pray for their healing? And God heal them, and that person get the glory. Is that not dumb? Is that the kind of God we serve? That he wants to destroy you or put you in your lowest place, Chris. Get you down there, as they'll saying, lower than a snake's belly in a wagon rut, just so he can lift you up and say, look at me. That's an Arkansas term there, brother. Lee. Might, might have come from Oklahoma. But is that? Is that the God we serve? That he wants to crush you? So he can raise you up and say, now look what I did. That's not the God we serve. Our God wants us to live life abundantly. He wants you to have life abundantly and even more abundantly. He wants you to be more than a conqueror. He wants you to have everything you need. He wants you to live the best. He wants you to have the fatted calf. Why did the prodigal son, it's a good thing the prodigal son had a, had a daddy that believed in God. First of all, the prodigal son had never had any money to go out and blow. And when he got ready to come back home, there wouldn't have been no fatted calf. There would have been some old skinny goat. But my father has a fatted calf. My father has a ring. My father has a necklace. My father has everything I need because he owns it all. 
And if he owns it all and he created it all, why does he want to withhold it from you? See, we got this idea that it's, that it's worldly to want the goods in this world. Why is that worldly? Who created them? Did he create good things or bad things? Now, does he want to withhold those good things from you? Am I making any sense? This is where God's wanting to move us to. I was serious when I said people will flock here when they find out none of us have doctors. <laughs> I'm serious. That preacher never has to go to the hospital and visit church members because they're never sick. Whoa! <laughs> How about that? How about that? Is that okay? Is that okay? Whoa! That's better than okay. I've been in the hospital and I don't ever want to have to go back. I can find a whole lot better things to do than wind up in the hospital. <laughs> Look at verse 10. Those who sat in darkness in the shadow of death bound in affliction in irons because they rebelled against the words. What? What did they rebel against? I say that again. What did they rebel against? The words of God. What words did they rebel against? God's words. We confess them every day, don't we? Don't rebel against them. Don't dare say they're not true. Because they re Verse 11, Because they rebelled against the words of God and despised the counsel of the Most High, therefore he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down, and there was none to help. Then they cried out to the Lord in the trouble, and he saved them out of their distress. Now, did God put them in their distress? What put them in their distress? Their rebellion. Against what? The words of God. Are you catching on yet? Are you getting it? <laughs> As Brother Lee says, are you with me? <laughs> are you with me? <laughs> Woo! I can pick on him now. I know him well enough. Verse 15, Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for His goodness and for His wonderful works to the children of men. For He has broken the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron in two. Fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities, were afflicted. Wait a minute. What did He just say? Verse 17, read it with me. Fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities, were afflicted. Now, God says, I've got a plan over here. And here's what this plan is. And you can read it in Deuteronomy chapter 28. Here's all the blessings. If you'll follow his commandments, man, who, what fool would not want to follow that? What person would not want to follow that? But they didn't. And so God said, I had it all laid out for you. Everything you needed, everything you desired, the blessings were going to overtake you. Can I say that again? The blessings of God were going to overtake you. But because you chose to rebel against the words of God. Fools. Fools. It's foolish. It is foolish for us not to believe what God says who we are. And to walk in it. Did you know there are a lot of foolish Pentecostals walking around on this earth today? They love the Spirit of God. I don't doubt that one bit. And they love God with all of their heart. They love everything. There's a lot of foolish Baptists and Methodists. There's a lot of foolish Christians walking around today. And I believe they love God with all of their heart. But they are misled because they refuse to believe what God said in His Word about, what, about how He treats His people and what He wants to do for them. And they're rebelling against the very words of God. And that's why they're in their transgressions. So God says, fools. They're fools because of this. He goes on and he says this. 
Their soul abhor, abhorred all manner of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried out to the Lord in the trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. See what I want to say here now. John chapter 24, verse 12 says, Verily, verily. Now, what did I say to y'all the other day? Verily, verily. When that is mentioned, that, that means really take note. This is something very, very important. Anytime you see very, verily, verily, or truly, truly, really, that's emphasizing, emphasizing what Jesus is saying here. So this is with emphasis, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, the greater works, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Now, what was the works? O Theophilus. The former treatise have I given to you of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. The doing was the works. Now what works? It wasn't out here keeping himself so busy in the sanctuary that they were not amounting to anything. The works that Jesus did was the healing ministry. Everywhere Jesus went, people were healed. He healed all manner of disease. Eighty percent of the ministry of Jesus was for healing. 80% of what Jesus did in his ministry was healing the sick. 80%. What do you think about that? He don't want us to be sick, does he, Thomas? If God wanted us to be sick, friends, why would healing be one of the gifts of the Spirit? You remember the scripture where Jesus answered to, uh, to the men when they said, how this man cast out this devil except by, by the works of the devil? And Jesus said, would Beelzebub cast out Beelzebub? That doesn't make sense. Well, neither does it make sense on this other fact. Now, here's the deal. I'm not a healer. I'm not a healer. But the healer lives in me. And he can give that gift to you and to me and to all of us. And I honestly believe that as we begin to walk in and begin to proclaim these words and not rebel against the words of God and begin to proclaim these words, you're going to see people getting well in this church. And you're going to see less and less money spent at the drugstore and more and more money spent to build the kingdom of God. Because that's where God wants it. The works that Jesus did. So we find that works and healing are brought into the same situation here. The works was the healing ministry of Jesus. If you look in Psalm 107 where it says that, that, that he sent his word and healed them. In other words, he brought them out of their distresses. He brought them out of their sickness. He brought them out of their lowly places. They were there of their own doing, not God didn't put them there. They went there be and it was in those places because of their own undoing, not because of God. And God delivered them out of it. He sent His Word and healed them. You know what? God is sending His Word to restoration, Christian fellowship, to heal you and to heal me, and to let us walk in health. Can you say amen? God, send your word to RCF. God, send your word to this church, and let it be like a beacon shining out of the, and like a city set up on a hill that cannot be hid. We prayed Sunday night for a breakthrough, and I believe breakthrough is here. I, Brother Lee, I believe breakthrough happened last Sunday night, and I believe it was here again this morning. If you'd have been here last Sunday night, you'd have seen me run, skip, not run, skip down that aisle and right back up here. I couldn't do nothing but sound like, I, I, what was I was going, woo, 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 sound like some fire truck or some siren. I could every time I opened my mouth, that's all that come out. I finally got tickled because that was all I could do was laugh because I, everything, every time I opened my mouth, I was woo, woo, woo. You know? <laughs> What you laughing for? <laughs> Brother Dan fell face first out down here on this floor. The glory of God came upon this place Sunday night. Now, it wasn't like it was back in the summer when, when a spirit of laughter broke out. Oh, there was laughter here, but there was something that happened here Sunday night. Wasn't there, Evan? There was something that happened here Sunday night. Y'all, I'm going to say it one more time. Maybe you'll get excited. 
there was something that happened here Sunday night in the prayer meeting. And it changed the atmosphere in this place. And it changed the faith of the believers in this place. It changed the faith of the preacher in this place. It changed us because we're believing God for miracles. Yeah, we're going to build a new building, and God's going to supply everything that we need to get it done. God's going to supply everything that we need to get it done. God's going to supply your needs, and you're in turn going to supply the needs of the church through God's gracious gifts. Something's happening. Something's happening. Is it happening in you? Are you excited? I barely made it this morning, preacher, but I'm here. <laughs> I got to say something here. And y- you folks forgive me for even bringing this up, but I got to say it. I put on Facebook last night. And people who lived in the state of Alabama knew what I was talking about. I just said, for all you who want to drown your sorrows, go to the Word of God and go to church tomorrow morning. (laughs) And I had a guy respond and said, don't give me any of that spiritual crap. I'll repent later. (laughs) That's exactly what he said. That's what he said. (laughs) But anyway, we're going to drown our sorrows in the Word of God, and we're not going to be sorrowful anymore. We're going to bring our troubles, and God's going to deliver us out of those troubles because He didn't want us there in the first place. He don't want you there in the first place. God don't want you there. He wants you out of it, out of it, out of it. Do you get it? (laughs) If you don't say, Preacher, I got it, I'm going to preach another 15 minutes. I knew that. I knew that would get a response. <laughs> and then he went on and he gave the, the in 1 Corinthians 12, he gave the, the description of the nine gifts of the Spirit. I'm going to conclude this morning with this. People are hungry for the supernatural. Do you believe me? People are hungry for the supernatural. They want the power. They desert. They want the power. They seek the power to heal. And to be healed when they need it. People need material help. They need to be lifted out of their out of their poverty. They need to be lifted out of poverty. People want freedom from sin and bondage. They're sick of living in it. They're sick of living in that freedom, that bondage. They're sick of living in sin. But they don't know what to do about it. And God placed Restoration Christian Fellowship to point those people to the Word of God where they can be delivered from their bondage, where they can be healed from their sickness, where they can be lifted out of poverty, where they can be set on a solid rock and a solid foundation, where it's not some fluffy thing that's coming along or some uh, uh, fly-by-night message that's being preached from this church, but it's the Word of God that wants to deliver people and set people free and bring healing to them. And you know what? If the world doesn't find the real supernatural working of the Holy Spirit in the church, then they're going to find it out there in the world in the form of Satan. Because he's supernatural too. And he has abilities and supernatural powers. The Word of God tells us these things. So we don't need to run from the supernatural. We don't need to run from the Spirit of God. You don't need to be afraid of the Holy Ghost. You don't need to be afraid of shaking a little bit and crying a little bit and bawling and squalling a little bit and a little bit of snot running or skipping down the center aisle or laying on the floor and laughing or weeping your eyes out. You don't need to be afraid of those emotions. God would never, ever hurt you. God would never hurt ever hurt you because he loves you just like you would not hurt your children God will never hurt you never never so let's not be afraid of God let's not be afraid of the gifts of the spirit let's not be afraid of the supernatural 
So they're going to get the real from the true gospel or they're going to get the counterfeit from the enemy. This former treatise have I written to you, the O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. All. Can you say all? And 80% of it was healing. People were saved. But people were healed through the ministry of Jesus. I want you to bow your heads with me. Paul, if you would, please. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus, and I thank you for the power of your spirit. I thank you for the power of the word of God. I thank you for the true word. And, Father, I pray that we will always, always speak the word of God with truth. Not just mixed with truth, but the whole truth. Lord, my desire is to never, ever lead any one of your children astray but to give them the whole counsel of God the whole counsel of God and your desire for them and for me now Father I pray right now during this altar time that the Holy Spirit would once again have his way you'll move among your people touch your people this morning Father I thank you for it in Jesus' name I pray. Hallelujah, Jesus. I want to ask you this morning, with your heads bowed and eyes closed for just a minute, I don't ever want to fail to give anyone here who may be unsaved the opportunity to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You see, that's the first step. That's the first step. If you're not a Christian this morning and you would like to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, would you slip your hand up and put it right back down? We want to pray with you. Yes, we'll call you forward. And yes, we'll pray with you. And we'll lead you in through the sinner's prayer. This will not be a mass prayer. This will be you praying to your Father as someone leads you. Anybody. Don't pull any punches and tell you like it is. Anybody. All right, I assume everybody here is a Christian. Then here's what I, I feel like the Lord would want us to do right now. If you, this morning, if the power of the Holy Spirit touched you, and you could agree with me that something is up, right? Yeah, it's Christmas, it's holidays, it's a busy time, but oh, what a greater time than for revival to break out than right here in the midst of the holidays. Woo, what a time for the river to start flowing. <laughs> what a time. If you will agree with me and say, Pastor, that's what I want I want the river to break out. I want, I want what God is up to. I want to see it happen in our church. I want to see it happen in my life. If that's you, I want you to stand to your feet. Yes, that's what I want. I want to see revival. I want to sense revival in my spirit. Oh, I, yeah, I want to sense revival. I want to sense that outpouring of the Holy Spirit in my family. I want to sense, I, want, I know, God, you're up to something. Now, what I want you to do, I want you to take the person, the hand of the person next to you, and I want you to ask them right now, and I want you to turn to them and say, will you, look, will you agree with me for a great outpouring of God's Spirit in our church and in our families? Would you do that right now in Jesus? And in our community, in our community. And now what I want you to do is I want you to begin to pray for that in the name of Jesus. Just begin to pray that prayer that God will pour His Spirit out upon your family, upon this church, upon this community, in the name of Jesus. Father, I come to you and I thank you, Lord. I thank you for the power of the word. I thank you for the power of words, Lord. Words that are spoken, Jesus. I pray, Lord, for a power and an anointing of the Holy Spirit to fall upon every family that is represented here today. Every family that is here today, God, that they would experience a power of the Holy Spirit in their home. Lord, when they walk into their home, when they get home from church today, when they walk in, they'll be able to sense that the Holy Spirit has preceded them and gone ahead of them into their home and anointed. They'll sense it when they walk in their house. They'll sense it when they walk in their house. Friend, I feel that prayer right now. I want you to pray that prayer. Lord, I want you to anoint my home. Precede me. Go before me today, Holy Spirit. 
Go before me and walk into my house in the name of Jesus. Walk into my home in the name of Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, Jesus. Walk into my home in the name of Jesus. And now I want you to pray, Lord, and I want you to precede us. Every time we come into this sanctuary, that the Holy Spirit will have been here before we even get here. And he, we will be ready to worship, ready to receive, ready to honor, ready to respect the house of God, ready to believe God for all things in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. And Lord, for our community. We agree together for the community of Hayden, Warrior, Corner, this entire general area of North Jefferson County, West Blunt County. Lord, I pray for the power of the Holy Spirit to begin to move in this place, in these communities, in people's homes and lives. Lord, I pray for those that are, that, that are, are, are sick today, God. I ask you to bless them and raise them up. This young man that was in this truck accident with this cattle trailer, Lord, I ask you in the name of Jesus to raise him up. Father, heal him today. Send your word and heal him in Jesus' name. Raise him up. Raise him up in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Now just sing this song together this morning before we go home. Hey, extend your hands this way. We're going to pray over the worship team right now. Woo! I can't know, don't know if I can stand up here. Woo! There's an anointing up here. Oh, la la ba shiko rabakata la ba. Hallelujah. 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 Okay, y'all ready? Let's pray over this worship team in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Let's, let's de- get, get on down there, guys. Get on down there. Woo-hoo. Hallelujah. Line up side by side, shoulder to shoulder. Hallelujah, Jesus. Mike had to leave, so be sure when you pray, let's include Mike in this prayer. He had to go to work. Okay. Let's let bro- let's, Brother Dan wants to read something real quick. And then we're going to pray. In 1980, a young man from Rwanda was forced by his tribe to either renounce Christ or face certain death. He refused to renounce Christ, and he was killed on the spot. The night before, he had written the following comment, which was found in his room. I am a part of the fellowship of the unashamed. The die is cast. I've stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I am a disciple of Christ Jesus. I won't look back, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. My, my past is redeemed. My present makes sense. My future is secure. I am finished and done with low living, slight walking, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tamed visions, Worldly talking, cheap giving, and dwarfed goals. My face is set. My goal is fast. My goal is heaven. My road is narrow. My way is rough. My companions are few. My guide is reliable. My mission is clear. I won't give up. Shut up. Let up. And I've, until I've stayed up, stored up, prayed up for the cause of Jesus Christ, I must go till he comes. Give till I drop. Preach till everyone knows. Work till he stops. And when he comes for me, he will have no trouble recognizing me because my banner will have been clear. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.